past eight. The Radio Waymo Breakfast. Issues of the day under T Radar. Joining us from Kaikoura today, T Radar, good morning. Good morning to you, sitting up uh, high on the hill, a lovely hotel room, looking straight out at the beautiful vista of the mountains, draped in snow, gently making their way down to the seaside, where gentle waves are lapping on the shore. Right, well, that was T Radar. Um, we'll leave him to that. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a what a what a position, what a place in the world. What a lovely, what a beautiful place, Kokura. It's what a wonderful example of a community that's really sort of uh, come alive in the last what fifteen or twenty years. You know, taken taken control of their destiny, so to speak, and made money by taking people out to watch whales. Well, so the bank ad says. <laughs> that's right. Yes, you ever done the whale watching? I never, no, never, never. Oh, I did it once. We were filming. Went out, watched a whale sleeping. Yeah, not quite as exciting as I'd imagined it was going to be, but... Uh, but it was on the surface. It was on the surface. What he did was came up and he slept on the surface for about 10 minutes and then flip of the tail and off he went again for 30 minutes. And yeah, then he came back up and slept again. You often hear people saying, oh, it was so amazing. It was like a spiritual experience, so amazing. But how much better can it be than seeing it on TV? Oh, uh, well, I guess it's sort of... They do say that people actually break down and cry. Wow. You know, they, they're so utterly moved by it. I thought it was more exciting. We saw a big big thing of dolphins. I thought they were a lot more exciting. They were doing something, you know. They were jumping over to them to get a stick or something, poke the whale and make it do a trick. But it's not really all that eco-friendly. <laughs> you say, roll over, whale. Sound. Roll over. Roll over, do it. It's like when you go to a zoo, you know, and all the animals are sleeping. It's yeah. boring. <laughs> yeah. You want to bang the on animal. the cage? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You know, you don't want to get them too entertained. They look, story of the week, there was a, a woman, because uh, I was thinking of going swimming with seals today, and, and I'm thinking again about that now, because uh, I think it was over near Perth, uh, a woman was leading a dive party to swim with dolphins, I think it was, and a, she was attacked by a great white shark, um, and really only safe because the shark swam past some burly man. And as uh, the shark was attacking her, the guy went, oh, this isn't on, and he grabbed the shark by the tail. Crikey. And the, t- the shark uh, was somewhat flummoxed by this and went, oh, I don't know what's going on here, and released the woman and swam away. Yeah. Yeah, she was quite badly injured. And uh, I think I saw a bit of footage on the news, very, very quick glimpse of the man. He hasn't sort of said what his name was or anything, but it was this big, burly guy with an enormous beard, and he didn't want to talk to the media or anything like that. He said, I just want to make sure the girl's okay. And was it, what, a, what a great Australian. And were, were this, what, was it sort of waist-high water or something like that? Was no, just... no, I think they were out in a boat. Oh, you know? okay. Oh, okay. yeah, no, they were, they were out in the, in the deep ocean. Oh, yeah, I don't know. As they say, you know, to catch a tiger by the tail, but he had a shark by the tail, and I'm yeah. not entirely sure what it was he planned to do with it at that stage. I suppose he just sort of react instinctively. Vicious. You didn't see that um, that uh, crazy guy was catching some fish, I think some African delta somewhere, but it was the, a fish like you'd never seen before. It had the uh, massive body, you know, sort of the, the size of your arms both outstretched, but, and the body was like the, that of a snapper, a very classic-looking fish, but the head was the most hideous crocodile-looking head. On it. Yes, I think I've certainly seen ones like that. Is it the guy that goes around and looks for sort of unusual fish and yeah. tries to and then he, ha- for them? he hassles them, pokes them, prods yeah. them. Yeah. Yes. Well, there's because you know, of course there's a New Zealand guy who sort of now he's got his own extreme fishing program who used to jump out of helicopters to catch bluefin tuna. Hmm. Have you seen that one? Yeah, I have. I don't. Get, mm. I don't get it. Hey, it's like, it's no. this is in the same way I don't get marlin fishing. No, it's all a bit odd. Jumping out and wrestling a fish in its own environment, it does strike me as a bit strange. Fine, maybe, if you let the fish go, but um, I don't know, just a bit. Or even letting go. I mean, the marlin fishing, sometimes that can take 12 hours to catch this one fish, that's and right. it's, it's, it's still tuck it out. It's only, it only gives up because it's tired. Yes, that's right. It's, sort of, it's a little ethically unsound, I suspect. Yeah. Yes. Well, then it has been the week for that. There's, there's a court case going on at the moment. I don't know if you've heard about it. There's a, a man by the name of David Cord. He's um, currently in jail for... Uh, Inappropriate acts upon uh, young children, and uh, they want to do a DNA sample of him. And he's saying, "Oh no, you can't take my DNA because uh, I'm a, I'm a Christian, and under the Book of Revelations, if my DNA is taken, uh, then I'll I'll have the mark of the beast, and I'll be damned forever." Oh, of course. And so, yes, yes, you know, um, it's a lovely little bit of hypocrisy. The fact that, oh well, if you take your DNA, you're damned. But the fact that you're in jail for molesting mm. children, well, yeah, that's that's not all that important, and you'll that you'll probably get a pass on that one. Outrageous. So the court case is uh, going on at the moment, and I suspect that probably within a week or so we'll find out the answer to that. But, you know, moral yeah. hypocrisy. Oh, but, but, so that's a bit shocking um, and a bit controversial. But what about um, this uh, controversial issue with the eth- ethnic affairs? Yes, you know, there's a, a carnival in Auckland. I think it's this weekend or next weekend. The Auckland International Carnival, they called it. And they've uh, sort of been 
uh, all sorts of uh, ethnic groups together, uh, Cook Islanders, Brazilians, Muslims, all sorts. Uh, there's sort of because they said there's, you know, there's a Chinese carnival and there's an Indian Diwali festival and all that, but there's no sort of multi sort of ethnic carnival. Um, and the Office of Ethnic Affairs ha- has pulled, I want them to pull all their logos off the um, pamphlets and website and paraphernalia because they said that on the website there were some inappropriate images of Cook Islanders and Brazilians, uh, you know, in their sort of um, carnival costumes, and they said, well, it's going to be offensive to Muslims. They never sort of consulted the Islamic society or anything like that. They sort of just made a, a unilateral decision that this would be offensive, and kind of interesting, you know, for, for something that's supposed to be sort of, mm. I guess, celebrating difference and, and all of the wonderful... And tolerance, yes. You know, and I would have thought that... One of the uh, the Islamic spokesmen said, you know, well, look, we'd probably understand that, that uh, you know, Muslims think, well, that's the way that they express their culture, and, and we would have to understand that, but um, how unilateral can, decision by how, the... Now, t Raider, how can a carnival about, you know... Um, harmony and tolerance and acceptance and cultural diversity make me feel a little bit intolerant. I don't know. It just seems to be one of those things, doesn't it? But um, it seems like it would be a good day. I think they're having a... It was quite a wonderful sort of uh, eclectic mix of things that were happening. I think there was a sort of a carnival parade, and then I think they were having sheep racing or something like that, so a little bit of a New Zealand touch there, and then uh, uh, various other things somewhere at one of the, uh, the race courses in Auckland. So, yes, marvellous day out. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, yeah, we could never have enough of these events. I think, um, yeah, and, and never have enough of these events. That's true. Staying with um, with cultural matters, uh, something we were talking about earlier on the show um, was about um, Te Rio and uh, in a bit of trouble. There's not not enough people speaking the Maori language, um, and, and particularly the young people coming through aren't learning it. Is it going to die out? Yes, it's quite a surprising thing because you know you, you sort of get the sense that more and more people are speaking it, and um, mm. certainly when you when you travel around to places. But I guess I guess maybe people are speaking it enough to sort of for maze and to and to sort of know a few words here and there. Is a you know I guess having this first language is is very very rare. And I was at Waikato University last week actually. They had a wonderful sort of presentation they have every year during their sort of thesis month or something like that, I think it is, and it's called Thesis in Threes, and people have three minutes to explain what their thesis is um, to a crowd of people. It goes through several rounds, and I, I host the final, and marvellous range of thesis uh, presented, but one of them was um, a young guy, and he was uh, inventing a computer program that allowed you to sort of learn languages, so what you would do is you would, I think what it does is you get certain texts and, and things, and, and it converts many of the words into, say, uh, what so if you're reading it through, it'll convert a lot of the words through into, and put them into a context that you'll understand. Huh. And then increasingly, as you go up the levels, it converts more and more of the of the document uh, into the language you're trying to learn. So you sort of learn, you know, initially a few words in context at a time. Wonderful sort of piece of, of technology, I suspect. It'll, it'll go very far. That's very cool. So that's coming out of what, Waikato? Yeah, it was coming out of Waikato, yeah. yeah. Cool. Very yeah, cool. That's fascinating. So yes, but no, certainly... Um, High up there, the white, was the Waitangi Tribunal, didn't it? It came out and said, yes, it's, it's, um, it's very endangered. So uh, maybe if, if we all learn a few more words this week, a couple of words a week. A couple of words a week, you reckon? Won't really do. Yeah. No, I no. guess what they really want is people to learn it, you know, fully. Yeah. Converse in it. Exactly, converse in it. Quite that, hard. Yeah. Maybe one day, T Radar, me and you, conversing maybe here one on day the radio. We, this, this whole sort of 10 minutes. Conducted uh, entirely in Rio and uh, Married Language Week 2025, a goal to aim for. Shall we aim because, for uh, I'm not all that. I've tried. Uh, have you tried? Tried learning it? Um, yeah. to, be, to be honest, no, no, not since school. No. Yeah, yeah, I've tried it. Um, you really need to have that kind of immersion, I think. Yeah. It's quite difficult. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much, Ray. Enjoy Kai Kolder. We'll see you again next week. All right. Kia ora. Kia ora. That's 25 minutes past.